Thank you, Richard. And now we hear from Devin Grayson Wallace, who's a member of the Peace Action Main Board. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Rosie. Do you want to raise it up? This is all right. Okay. I think. Got to eat it. Is this is this carrying? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Even closer? All right. Good afternoon. My name is Devin Grayson Wallace. I am 26 years old. I am originally from Long Island, New York, and I moved to Maine three years ago to build an adult life here. I am grateful to be here, and I love this state. Every time I go home to Long Island to visit with my family, the rush and the hustle and the bustle make me even more grateful that I get to return to up here. <laughs> However, I am only able to live here and work here thanks to federal assistance, all types of federal assistance. Social Security helped my dad raise my younger brother and I when my mom died when I was six. Federal Pell Grants and relatively low interest loans enabled me to earn a college degree without the crippling student debt that keeps many of my peers living at home. Knowing my widower grandfather, my mother's father, has a home in a senior community thanks to a federal Section 8 housing voucher gives me the peace of mind to feel like it's okay that I live four hours away, as long as I call every few days, of course. When Hurricane Sandy hit my dad, hit Long Island, my dad and my younger brother both lost uh, water and electricity for a week, and FEMA was driving around the neighborhood handing out bottled waters and checking on residents. I am grateful to live in a country where we have these programs, but I know that I and my family are so fortunate relative to many of my peers relative to many other families, relative to people of all ages in this state and around this country. And now I work at the University of Southern Maine and am more than happy to pay into Social Security and even more so to pay federal taxes so others can have help meeting their immediate needs and help moving forward with their lives the way that I've been able to do. However, we as a country don't even come close to meeting everyone's needs or helping every person who wants to go to college graduate without unmanageable debt payments. I don't think I need to go into details. I think everyone knows someone, most likely many someones, who are not able to have the kind of freedom and peace of mind that I have been so fortunate to have. And that is why I am downright furious we spend such a disproportionately high amount of our federal budget on the Pentagon, amassing weapons and making war. According to the National Priorities Project, breakdown of federal spending, in 2016, for every federal tax dollar that I paid, and everyone in this country paid, 23.4 cents went to the Pentagon. That doesn't even count the war spending that goes on the national version of a credit card that we haven't even begun to be paying back yet. Less than three cents on each of my federal tax dollars went to education, where my Pell Grants came from, and about two cents went to housing and community investments, which includes not just my grandfather's housing assistance and the FEMA aid that helped my little brother and my dad a couple years back, but other programs that are especially critical here in Maine, like low-income housing energy assistance that helps low-income Mainers wa keep warm in the winter. And all this when the U.S. spends $600 billion a year on the Pentagon, which is as much as the next seven countries in the world combined. Setting aside my personal moral objections to militarization and making war and intellectual arguments about whether any of this even makes us safer, I find this wrong. <clears throat> Before I moved to Maine, uh, I worked as a lobbyist on federal budget issues for the Friends Committee on National Legislation, a Quaker lobby in the public interest. And in, among the ins and outs that I learned there on Capitol Hill, I learned that our best, maybe our only resource to turning this around and investing in our greatest strength, our people, is to take the opportunity we all have to talk to our legislators. So that's something that I will be doing, even more so in the next couple years, and I encourage each of you to do the same. Thank you, Devin. And now we'll hear from Joseph De Rivera, who's also on the Peace Action Main Board. If we're going to stop global warming, we have to cut the Pentagon budget. Part of that's pretty obvious. We've got a finite amount of money. And if we spend it on the Pentagon, we can't spend it on the Environmental Protection Agency. 
On the other hand, if we audit the Pentagon and cut the waste that's there, that money could go to the Environmental Protection Agency, to the research we need to stop global warming. And I want to talk, I think that's obvious, but I want to discuss three other reasons why we have to cut the Pentagon budget if we're going to stop global warming. The first of these is that the Pentagon is the world's largest contributor to CO2. People don't realize how much the Pentagon contributes to global warming. Forgive me for giving you a few figures here. The, the U.S. military usage is 300 and 320,000 barrels of oil a day. That doesn't include the fuel consumed by contractors leased to private facilities or in the production of weapons. In one year, the Pentagon spent over $17 billion on oil. It emitted more than 70 million tons of CO2. And that doesn't include what was spent, what was emitted in our overseas bases. Yet this information isn't readily available because by law and under the UN framework on climate change, military emissions are not counted toward our global CO2 footprint. It's all masked. I'm just talking about ordinary military operations. If we want to talk about wars, it gets even more sobering. The Iraq war alone was responsible for at least 141 million tons of CO2. That, to put that in, in some context, that equals the admissions of 25 million cars in that one war. But there's a second reason why we have to cut the military budget. The international community, in order to stop global warming, nations have agreed to invest billions of dollars in the infrastructure that's needed, particularly in underdeveloped countries, so that they can invest in alternative energy rather than burn coal and contribute to CO2. That requires billions of dollars from governments. We're behind in our pledges. We don't have the money to invest in what we have to invest in for, to, to help underdeveloped countries not emit CO2 unless we take that money from somewhere and the best place to take it is from the Canada on budget. There's a third reason. The corporations produce jobs. Those jobs could be producing windmills. They could be, those jobs could be working in rapid transport. Those jobs could be working on solar, but they're not. Why aren't corporations building and build, having, investing in jobs that could build what we really need? It's because corporations are interested in profits. It's not just that they're interested in profits, but they're, by law, required to maximize profits. Thus, a company like General Dynamics, which could profitably produce in our bath shipyard barges, windmills, other things that we really need, produces destroyers because, not because they couldn't make a profit on windmills, not because they couldn't make a profit on barges, but because they can make more of a profit on destroyers. The profit margin is greater. The government, our government, has to create jobs by taking, military, by taking 
money from the military budget and putting it into jobs that we need. It could be done. Oh, I thought you meant step closer to the mic. Jeez. <laughs> Thank you, Joseph. That was great. I appreciate it very much. Now we're going to hear from Leslie Manning. <clears throat> I'll be right over to hold that. Leslie Manning, representing the War Tax Resistance Center. I won't be able to cut you off, so don't be long. 